Ah, Julia. Uh, at a Kraven factory? You sound surprised. Last time we did this, you took me to Chez Pierre. Julia, it was your riddle that brought me here. This is the riddle you sent to me. I sent no such thing. Likewise. It would appear someone is playing a prank. And how would they know about our game? Everybody, Higgins. Detective Murdoch said he was out on a personal matter, and Detective Watts went to investigate a corpse found in a sewer off Queen Street. What about Crabtree? Uh, we got a telephone call from Detective Murdoch and then left. Oh. Higgins Newsom. Watts, please. I'm sorry, sir. Detective Watts is on the scene of a crime. Who is it? Uh, it's it's Detective Murdoch. He wants Watts. I'll take it. Murdoch. Meet me at Kirkham's factory in 10 minutes. Do not tell anyone where you're going. What's this all about? 10 minutes. Oh. Oh. William? William? Hello? Sir? Hello? on the plating floor. I, I can hear the dynamo running. Dynamo? This was an electroplating facility. It would have required high voltage direct current. Why would it be running? I thought this building was being demolished. Hmm. Jail under God. What? It's a message on the wall, surrounded by switches. I have the same, only mine says, I can wholly murder him. Oh, yeah. Anagrams, do you think? <laughs> Jail Under God is an anagram for Dr. Chu Lia Ogden. Mine must be your name, William. <sighs> Henry Murdoch. Where's Murdoch? Uh, sir. My murder. Warn it. So what now? Hello? Hello? Are you ready to play the game? To leave your room, you must first solve a riddle. Do you understand? Who is this? Yes, we understand. What is this all about? With every clue, the voltage doubles. With every guess, the voltage doubles. With every quarter hour that passes... Yes, yes, the voltage doubles. Clue number one. Without you, it's as if I'm covered in gold. What am I? This is the worst prank 
ever. Did Detective Murdoch call you also? He telephoned for what's but I took the call. What the bloody hell's he playing at? Murdoch? To leave your room, you must first solve a riddle. Do you understand? No. With every clue, the rotation doubles. What? With every guess, the rotation doubles. With every quarter hour that passes... What are you on about? Who is this? What bloody rotation? Clue number one. Without you, it's as if I'm covered in gold. What am I? What are you? But I'm Bugly Final. Sir? Covered in gold? Gilded? I am gilded? Could it be that simple? I don't think so. Who is you? And why the qualifier, it's as if? Gilded-ish? Ow! What happened? I got a shock from the table. That must be what he meant by voltage. The table is acting as a charged capacitor. Just stay away from the table and you should be fine. We're going to need another clue. I know. It's retaining by a thread attached to something rotating in the ceiling. A trophy? What? That's what's covered in gold. Is this about me fumbling the ball at last year's police games? Uh, sir, they said you. There's two of us. You could mean me. I suppose it could mean the letter you. There's no you in trophy, Crabtree. It's trophy. Uh, sir, wait. The answer is trophy. Incorrect. Oh. Would you like another clue? Would you like another clue? Go on. Clue number two. Mixed up without it, I become ugly. Mixed up without it? What's it? Bloody what? what? Why couldn't he have taken the Murdoch's call? No offence, Crabtree. I'm taken, sir. <laughs> Seems to be a male. Dead about a year based on the decomposition. We found this in the skeleton. Who found him? Miss Cherry, do you normally take strolls through abandoned back alleys? I was investigating an unrelated matter. How do you know it's unrelated? I received a tip that a restaurant was serving dog meat and disposing of the bones into the storm drains. Woof. Detective, found this in his wallet. Promissory note. Hmm. Mixed up without it, I become ugly. What am I? Are we looking for an object? A person? Is it even a noun? The first clue would suggest that it's an adjective. Ow! I wasn't even touching it! It must have arced. Are you all right? Whoever's behind this, I want them charged with assault. You hear that? With assault! It was a different table! Oh. The current must be shifting from table to table. There are eight tables in all, correct? Not counting the middle, yes. Right. One wire for two tables. I have an idea. Keep still. <sighs> Mixed up without it, I become ugly. It makes no bloody sense. Uh, sir, I think our efforts would be best spent dealing with the Hornets directly. You think we should negotiate with them? Sir, whoever set all of this up was expecting Detective Watts. Oh, I see. You think that I'm too dim-witted to solve the riddle? Sir, we are both too dim-witted. So what's your plan? Well, sir, you are a substantial sort. Substantial? Be careful what you say next, Crabtree. Uh, sir, uh, stout, well-built. Mm -hmm. And you wear an undershirt, do you not? What of it? Sir, I'm thinking. Now, if we took your undershirt, tied off the ends, I think there would be room enough to hold the hornet's nest if we could chop it down and catch it. Every telephone has two magnets inside. One in the receiver and one in the earpiece. How a magnet's going to help us? 
An electrical wire creates a magnetic field proportional to its current. Now, the magnet's deflection will tell us which of the tables is being charged. Uh, move to the west side of the room. Ow! Julia, you're north. I told you to go west. How am I supposed to know which way is west? Well, now you know. The voltage is going to double any moment. I know. We're going to need another clue. Clue three. Clue number three. Paul said you were me before you were born. He said, who's Paul? Uh, move north. What? <sighs> there are still gaps. Well, we'll just have to move quickly. Oh, this is going to be impossible. What, sir, no, you stay in one place. I'll try to land. Not bloody likely. Well, you have a better idea. No, I don't. It discharged through the center table. Julia, for it to arc that distance would require a million volts. If it hits you, it could kill you. Ah! Oi, are you ready? About to sting you. Right then. So how do we get out of here then, bug lugs? Clues, sir. We need more clues. You were me before you were born. What does that mean? Perhaps it's biblical. Uh, move north. Uh, biblical as in as in Paul the Apostle? Possibly. Uh, move east. Paul, uh, did he say you were me before you were born? Not directly. Perhaps it's to do with original sin. After all, it's, it's a state we were in before we were born. Uh, move west. Uh, uh, sin, guilt, guilty, William, that's it. It fits all of the clues, guilty. I am guilty. Very good, Julia. Paul said you were me before you were born. Who's Paul? I don't know any Pauls. <sighs> Next. Clue number four. I exist whenever one pleads that I do not. What am I? Next. Clue number five. No one can see that you are me, but soon they will. Just wait and see. Well, oh, please, that one rhymes. Next. Clue number six. When the T was gone, you left. So G, I left as well. Y and L are the others remaining. How would we bloody know? Uh, yeah. Sir, wait. Those words were letters. Oh, you're doing riddles now. Uh, what did they say? Uh, when the T was gone, you left. So G, I did too. Y and L are the others remaining. It's not a question. It's a statement. Y and L. So the letters spell a word. Sir, mixed up without it, I'm ugly. Without it, we must be on the right track. Guilty. It's guilty. Guilty? The answer is, I am guilty. Who needs what, Crabtree? <laughs> What is this room? I don't think we should stay in. Murdoch, Dr. Ogden. Sir, George, 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 George! Oh. <sighs> what are you two doing here? You told us to come. I did not. I told you, on the phone. You called me as well, sir. What exactly did he say? 
You told me to come to the Corkum factory and not to tell anybody where I was going. It must have been an edited recording of my voice. We were tricked into coming here as well. By whom? I don't know, but whoever it is has clearly targeted the police. What about Dr. Ogden? Well, perhaps it's to do with a case you helped solve. Maybe it's someone we know personally. Our captor certainly has very personal information. As James Pendrick invented a potion that's turned him evil. Yes, sir, so I think it's quite obvious who's behind this. Who? James Gillies. Oh, George, James Gillies is dead. Is he? His brain is in a jar on my desk. Yes, exactly. In formaldehyde, perfectly preserved. What if somebody in the future takes that brain and transplants it into another living being? That person would then, ipso facto, be James Gillies. And wouldn't it be just like him to invent a time machine and come back to this moment to torment us further? Do you ever have a day off, Crabtree? <sighs> All right, well, if we make it out of here, at the very least, we're getting rid of that brain. Can I have my notebook, uh, please? Uh, 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 sir, I spoke with Frank Hoover. He's on his way in. He remembers writing the IOU. Who did he write it to? Yes. A man named Phineas Smith from Weston. Phineas Smith, I know that name. He was a witness in the Osborne robbery case. The Osborne robbery case, wasn't that? I was interviewing an eyewitness in the Osborne robbery case. I left here at 1.30. It was an hour ride to his home. We spoke for 20 minutes, an hour ride back, and spent the rest of the day here at the station house. Our victim was Detective Murdoch's alibi in the murder of Raymond Huckabee? Well, Fellows is currently on trial for that murder. My goodness, I didn't know that. Uh, yes, can we help you? I'm Frank Hoover. This bloody door's not budging. We're definitely locked in. The drain has been cemented shut. Look, William, it's your camera. How did they get that here? He's watching us. Why are all these holes in the wall? I don't know, but these walls have been recently constructed. Especially for us? The book has gone all out. Indeed. But for what purpose? Perhaps they want us to solve a case. The screwdriver has blood on it. Maybe it's about revenge. He thinks we bollocks the case. Of which case? Sir, look at this. A curious silhouette of something. Or someone? Oh, I gave this to Phineas the last time I ever saw him. Uh, where was that? At, at the Queen's Hotel. That's where he was staying. He normally lives in uh, Weston. Why was he staying there? I don't know. It had to do with something with him keeping out of his house for a period. He was getting paid for it, and that's why I was there. I needed the money. Who paid him? I don't know. I didn't get a chance to speak with him. He was having dinner with someone. Is this the man you saw him with? No, no, it was a woman. Attractive. I remember because he wasn't much to look at. Uh, that's her. Mm -hmm. Some mark, reverse whirl, number five. It's mine. I am guilty. Of course. Our captor doesn't want us to solve a crime. He wants us to confront our own guilt. Guilt? For what? We haven't killed anybody? That's not what she thinks. She? Julia. Have a look at the silhouette again. It's our pelican. The one that Goldie Huckabee stole. <gasps> Somehow it ended up in our house. I can imagine Raymond must have taken it. He was funny that way. If you like something, he just took it. <laughs> it's Goldie. This is revenge for her husband's murder. You're telling me your bloody neighbor's trying to kill us. Show yourself, Goldie. I suppose congratulations are in order. You've made it this far regrettably unscathed. Why are you doing this? Because I hate you, and I want you to suffer. We've done nothing to you. 
You killed my husband and tried to set me up for the crime. We have explained. Did you think me so stupid? <laughs> yes, you did. You may be reassessing that now. Is there a way out of here? Alive? Of course. But you'll have to be very clever. But very lucky. I expect you'll fall short on both counts. Why not just torture and kill us? Why? Challenge you? Because I want to see you struggle. I want to see your hope flicker before it dies. All right, fine. What is it you want from us? On the door, you see two panels. Embedded in each is a puzzle. The puzzles represent the two stages of my husband's death. The pain he felt as he was stabbed to death and the disintegration of his body as it rotted. Neither of those sound very good. Upon completion of the puzzles, the door will open and you'll be free to leave. I would advise you to work quickly. The punishments increase with time. What punishments? <laughs> September 19th was the day that Raymond Huckabee was murdered. Mrs. Huckabee claimed to be at her mother's in Unionville. Well, that was clearly a lie. What, you didn't check her alibi? Um, oh, no, that's right. Ralph Fellows was your only suspect. He did commit the murder, Miss Jerry. Did he? He confessed. And then later pled not guilty. We did check her alibi. Her mother must have lied. Has <laughs> Mrs. Huckabee been located? Not yet, sir, but constables are searching her house as we speak. So we just need to put the tiles in the correct order. Yes, but what's the correct order? This is an image of some kind. William, does that look like the tip of a ski pole? A ski pole? Yes, Julia, that's right. This is a schematic drawing of the machine that killed Raymond Huckabee. What was that? What was what, sir? That popping sound. Yes, I heard that as well. I'm trying to concentrate here. I thought you solved it. Well, sir, I still have to put the tiles in the correct order. There it is again. I think it's coming from the holes in the walls. William? I think I see something in there. Move your head! Oh. Sirs! Everybody, take cover! She said that each puzzle would represent a stage in her husband's death. The first stage she felt was the pain upon being stabbed. Uh, ah. oh. 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 Spectre! Stay still. Margaret bought me that for my birthday. I've almost got it. Oh, no, William, go back. The lawnmower blade was on the left side. Yes, of course. Sorry, I think the darts are firing at random. Really, Cocktree? That's it. <sighs> oh, for heaven's sake. It appears Raymond Huckabee was incurring debts. This is the fifth request for payment. He was a gambler. I'm a lousy one at that. How can you be sure? Private detective report. She hired a snoop to find out how bad it was. Number one reason to never get married. Gambling? Gambling, divorce, precipitous health decline. Nothing wipes out one's savings faster than a bad marriage. Were you not yourself considering marriage a short while back? <sighs> Case in point. He turned out to be a murderer. If we were married, the League of Bulls would have ruined me. Ah, uh -huh. so no marriage for you then. Consider me a confirmed bachelorette. Well, consider me your counterpart. You're a confirmed bachelor? Uh... You seem surprised. Oh, you just haven't been in love. No, you're very wrong about that. What was her name? Jack Lynn. <clears throat> well, if you were so in love with Jacqueline, why didn't you marry her? Because someone else will be assuming that honor shortly. Oh. Sorry. Yes, me too. Uh, is this... What? 
What does this look like to you? Looks like an early sketch of the device that killed Raymond Huckabee. Why would it be in Goldie Huckabee's personal papers? Sir, this was found in her attic underneath some junk. Uh huh. Clearly, she didn't want it to be found. Oh. I can see why. Thank you, Constable. She was having an affair. Well, how do you know? There's a whole stack of love letters from some besotted sap. It's enough to make Keats blush. You think you had a bad? Oh my lord. What? Look who they're from. Hmm. Ralph. Ralph Fellows. They were having an affair. The handwriting is a match. They were written by Ralph Fellows. And Goldie Huckabee? We found these in her house, along with hard evidence she murdered Phineas Smith. Detective Murdoch's alibi. Mm. There's also evidence she may have been responsible for the murder of her husband. You may have the wrong person on trial. Terrific. Just terrific. Two years ago, you charged Ralph Fellow's sister with four counts of murder. I obtained a conviction. That conviction was overturned because your detective insisted that it was Ralph Fellow's. Then Raymond Huckabee is killed. And Murdoch insists Fellows did that too. So I prosecute. Quite effectively, I may add. And now you tell me that Goldie Huckabee was the one that committed that crime. Well, where is she? We can't find her. No clue. No. Why am I here? Well, we found this in Goldie Huckabee's house. Will your perfidy never end? Perfidy? Was my confession not enough to keep you jackals off her? Mr. Fellows... You and I both know Detective Murdoch killed that poor woman's husband. All of the evidence pointed to it. Instead of getting justice done, you manufactured evidence against her. Surely you are not pursuing a theory that Mrs. Huckabee murdered her husband with a custom-made murder machine and then framed Detective Murdoch? As you know, spouses are often to blame in these cases. Oh, no, 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 no. That was done to trap you. <laughs> he didn't trap me. <clears throat> well, Mr. Fellows... I watched you plant those springs so I could find them. You think I'm not up to your tricks? Where is he, by the way? Why am I talking to a second-rate detective? The one responsible is the one that should be hearing us. Did you kill Raymond Huckabee? You know very well I didn't. Then why confess to a crime you didn't commit? To stop you and the corrupt machinery of the law from railroading the only woman I ever loved. Goldie Huckabee. Tell the truth. Do you think your great detective would have been accepting of anything less than my limp body hanging from the scaffold? Huh? William M. is smart, but... Another anagram, you think? I believe so. What does the final challenge represent? His disintegrating corpse, if I remember correctly. This building is slated for demolition. Perhaps she means for us to be buried alive. Well, if that's the case, she'll be disappointed. They always send a man beforehand to check for drunks and squatters. Or maybe... Perhaps she means for us to be drowned. Perhaps that's why the drain is blocked. Ow! Oh! That's not water. It's burned. It must be some kind of acid. Sulfuric acid. It's one of the electrolytes used in tin plating. There will be plenty on hand. I believe I understand the meaning of the final challenge. It isn't about being interred. It means our bodies dissolving. Ago, I 
was summarizing my closing arguments. Uh, apologies, but it felt like relevant information. Of course, it's relevant. But until we interview Goldie Huckabee, we have no way of establishing the veracity of any of this. Unfortunately, it seems that Mrs. Huckabee has fled. And I will ask to stay the proceedings until we can locate her. As his lawyer, I will oppose that motion. You've used every trick to delay this trial to this point. The trial must go ahead. I will introduce this new evidence as is. Hmm. Lunch? Why not? So, have we just saved an innocent man from the noose or allowed a killer to walk free? He's not free yet. Oh, they won't convict now. If nothing else, the evidence against Mrs. Huckabee allows for reasonable doubt. Maybe that was the plan. You think he planned this? Ralph Fellas may not be the world's smartest man, but he's perhaps the most relentless. You do realize none of this would have happened if you hadn't stumbled across Phineas Smith's skeleton. Yes, I was in the sewer looking for dog bones. Who gave you the tip? A woman. She didn't leave her name. But I did take down her number. Let's go. Uh, I can't go down this street. Why? It's the shortest route to the police Can station. Please go a different way. Uh, there's a police call box one street over. <sighs> Fine. Inspector, are you all right? Tickety boo. No need to worry about me, bug looks. Smart. Liam M is smart, but whoever that is, is smarter? Ralph. Ralph F. Ralph Fellows. Of course he's a part of this. I knew Goldie wasn't this smart. So that's it, you've solved it. All we have to do is put the tiles in the right order and we're out of here. Indeed, George, but I'm afraid you'll find it's impossible. How's that? These last two letters are reversed. So? Mathematicians have discovered that a 15-tile puzzle is impossible to solve when the last two letters are reversed. Bastard. So this is Mr. Fellow's parting joke? He intends for us to die. Sir? Doctor? I think you should get up on the table. <sighs> Goldie Huckabee. Your tipster was Goldie Huckabee? Why would she want you to find the body of the man she killed? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe they were in cahoots. She tips you off and disappears. Fellows follows after he's acquitted. No, she would have sold her house first, consolidated her assets. It's like she didn't plan any of this at all. Maybe she didn't. Maybe no. No. Oh, uh, yes. No. <clears throat> Can't be. What? What if this is all Ralph Fellows doing? No, you're right. That's impossible. You yourself said he was relentless. All right, explain. Ralph Fellows killed Raymond Huckabee with the intention of setting up Detective Murdoch. Just as he confessed? That was his primary plan. Call it Plan A. But just in case it didn't work out, he had a secondary plan. Plan B? To set up Goldie Huckabee for both murders. Huh. So she didn't kill her husband? Oh, she didn't kill anybody. Ralph Fellows did it all and planted evidence pointing to her. And he did this all a year ago before he was jailed. He convinced her Detective Murdoch killed her husband and tried to set her up. And then he valiantly fell on the sword for her to protect her from malicious prosecution. He then manipulated her into tipping you off to something she knew nothing about. No. The plan only works if Goldie disappears. Forever. How would he arrange that? And what about the due diligence on the part of the police? He'd have to get rid of you, Detective Murdoch, anyone who would suspect his hand in this. Hmm. Where is Detective Murdoch? Yes, it was Ralph who designed this. He told me how you tried to set me up for the murder you committed. He was in prison. They intercept all correspondence. How did he communicate his plan to you? Well, he encoded instruction in the letters he wrote from prison. Hmm. Why did he choose to kill us in this manner? Because he hates you as much as I do. Well, yes, but he could have killed us a thousand different ways. Why make us disappear completely? Why not? 
Because if there's anything I know about Ralph Fellows, he has a reason for everything he does. Everything has a purpose, including you being here. I wanted to be here. Uh, of course you did. And he counted on that. Tell me. Can you leave? <laughs> of course. Oh. Then try. <laughs> Part of Ralph Fellow's plan is falling into place. Ow! What in the world? Some sort of erotic poem, it looks like. It makes no sense to me. This was on the postcard from Dr. Ogden. Yes, he came in here, wrote this all out, and then left. And he didn't say where he was going. None of them did. Oh, I, it's a riddle. The beginning letters of each word have to be transposed to other words to create, uh, go to 36. Tate. Tate. Uh, find me in the. Back over. Back over the plating floor. Be here uh, by. Eight. Please. Eight, please. Do not. Be late. <gasps> Some sort of an invitation. Idea of fun? Well, it truly doesn't surprise me. I'm not sure if it's annoyingly romantic or just plain annoying. Uh, sir, 36 Tate Street, that's Kirkham's electroplating factory. I thought that was being demolished. It won't budge. Be careful, William. How do you access the lock mechanism? I don't know. You transcribed the instructions. I didn't understand them. Uh. William, sulfuric acid carbonizes wood. I'm not sure how long the, the table's going to support us. Sir, this might be a good time to tell you. It's been an honor serving under you. Oh! you shut up, William Crabtree. William. I'm not giving up. So help me God, if we get out of your line, I will wring your tiny neck like a chicken. Shh, 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 shh. There's somebody up there. Hello? Hello? Help! Help! Time to ask for a raise. The jury deliberated all of ten minutes. Apparently, there wasn't a dry eye in the courtroom. What have you, George? Sir, no sign of him. He seems to have left the courthouse and disappeared. Of course he did. That was the plan. I don't think he planned on living his life on the run, Inspector. Not with Detective Murdoch on his trail. What's to become of Mrs. Huckabee? Well, given she tried stinging, stabbing, shocking, suffocating us, and nearly searing us in a vat of sulfuric acid, I believe she'll be going to jail for a very long time. Well, at least our pelican is safe. Jurors openly wept at the anguish Mr. Fellows expressed over the duplicity of the woman he loved for whom he intended to sacrifice himself. Well, it's all your fault, Miss Cherry. My fault. It was you who found the body. I believe that's a burden we both share, Detective Watts. No regrets? No. I acted with integrity at every point. Oh, you always do. That's not a common opinion. Oh, I don't have common opinions. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's my fault I uh, misread your intention. No, i just not. Uh, Ready, I'm still... In love with her, yes. Something like that. Oh. Apologies.
Thank you. Where in the world is your friend, Ralph Fellows? You said the same thing about Easter. Well, the city comes alive at Easter, too. Is there nothing about holidays that excites you? Well, there is one thing. You come alive. <laughs> Moving pictures. When are they going to give up on that? Nobody likes them. I quite like the pictures. I once saw one with creatures from Mars. <gasps> oh, I hear there's going to be vaudeville tonight. Acts from all over. Now, that sounds all right. Mm. Know me? How lovely. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Thomas, isn't that that inspector, with, uh, the one whose wife has the glass eye? I think so. They're so charming. We should go say hello. Not right now, Margaret. Why not? I owe the inspector a few dollars. Uh, excuse me, ladies. I need to have a word with Murdoch. <sighs> Sir, you're just in time. I have an announcement. Spit it out, then, Higgins. Ruth is with child. Oh, <laughs> congratulations, Henry. Yeah. Uh, procreation. The human race is nothing if not relentless. That's marvelous. I didn't think you had it in you, Higgins. Congratulations. <laughs> That's terrific, Henry, but uh, shouldn't cigars and celebrations wait till the actual birth? I mean, not just add an announcement of something still months away. Well, who cares? We'll have cigars and celebrate every day. To Hieronymus Higgins Newsom. Who? Oh, no, no, it's all wrong. Where did we find you wet brains? Were you grown on a dirt farm? George, that's Obi Stratford. Aha! Some fans of VOD, I see. I hope you'll all be at the show tonight. I've got acts coming in from all over. Not to mention yours truly. Ah, oh, look at this lovely lady. Oh, I tell you, the way the ladies dress in the big cities these days, woo-wee! I tell you, if styles keep advancing, I hope I live five years longer. <laughs> Is that meant to be funny? <laughs> I believe the joke lies in the incongruence of lasciviousness. Just enjoy it. Obie Stratford is the biggest star in vaudeville. That's right. And tonight, all the biggest stars will be gathered here. But none will <laughs> shine as bright as Obie Stratford. <laughs> oh, what in God's name? It would appear he fell out of that fourth-story window. Fell or jumped. Perhaps he wasn't a fan of vaudeville, like yourself? He was a vaudevillian, I'd wager. This is the hotel where I'm putting up all the acts. Oh, you knew him? No. Comics are a depressed lot. You put enough of us in the same place, one of us is bound to jump out a window. Detective, I think your line of questioning may need adjustment. Oh? What have you, Miss Hart? The man was dead before he fell. Cause him death? I can't be certain yet, but the presence of petechiae and what appears to be a metallic contact burn suggests electrocution. Curious. I feel awful. I know in my head I'm glad for Higgins, but when he told us, I felt bad. He has something you hope to also have someday in your life. A moment of jealousy is perfectly normal, George. But did you feel the same? No. Honestly. You know me as a man prone to fabrications. I believe this is it. Suicide note. I can't take it anymore. Goodbye, written in block letters. The bathtub is empty, but the mirror is still fogged, and there's wet towels on the floor. This lamp is broken. So, the man had a bath, either pulled the lamp in or it fell in somehow. Either way, he died of electrocution, cleaned things up, and jumped out the window. Hmm, not likely. Was there any identification? I can tell you the man's name. Kenny McCluskey. How did you know him? Staying at the hotel. I met him last night. <laughs> Absolute riot. The only amusing man in the city, other than yours truly. And you are? I'm the funniest man in the world. Charlie Chaplin. What happened to the poor sucker? He wants to know. Arthur Carmichael. Charmed. 
Carmichael. I knew your father. Really? Sad business, that. Can't say I cared for him. Nor did I. You're that city coroner, aren't you? I've heard of you. Good for you. The coroner's office does not release any information on pending cases to the public. McCluskey was just off the train from Detroit. He said he didn't know a soul in Toronto. If he knew no one here, who would have wanted to kill him? I don't know. But Kenny knew how to make enemies. He was an insult comic. His whole act was making fun. Did you see him insult anyone last night? Oh, I certainly did. There was one man in particular who was hopping mad. <laughs> William, there you are. Any developments? As a matter of fact, Mr. Chaplin is taking us to a person of interest. Indeed. And if you'll pardon my interruption, here he is now. You there? What was your name again? Edward. You're Edward? You said it, pal. You're not Edward. We've met Edward, and you, sir, are not he. It must be a different Edward. What's your surname? I just told you. My name is Edward. He is Mr. Ward, given name Ed Edward. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, that's quite clever. <laughs> Did you simply steal Mr. Ward's name and persona? Steal? Of course not. I bought it. The name, the image, the props. A whole shebang. You paid money for... <clears throat> Mr. Ward, I, I understand that you met a Mr. McCluskey in the hotel bar last night? Kenny, yes, that's right. Threw himself out a window, did he? Well, we're not so sure about that. Confess to it, man. You almost killed Kenny last night with your bare hands. I did no such thing. He likened your hair to a mass of dead rats, and you just about throttled him. Mr. Chaplin, please. I'll conduct this interview. I wasn't angry at him for that. I was angry because he was a disrespectful half-wit who wouldn't know real Vaud if he sat on it. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's my... Flatulent sack. Hilarious. <clears throat> anyway, the man was alive and well last I saw him. He was wandering off with the kid here and his little friend, who, by the way, also seemed pretty annoyed with McCluskey. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have no intention of touching this investigation with a 10, nay, 11-foot pole. An 11-foot pole? But the things I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Something worse. Worse than you would touch with a 10-foot pole. Uh, Mr. Chaplin, your friend was also annoyed with Mr. McCluskey last night? Yes, that's true, but Stanley wouldn't hurt a fly. This is my understudy and my best friend in the whole wide world. Well, don't just stand there. Introduce yourself, you simpering Claude. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Stanley Laurel. It's lovely to meet you, Mr. Laurel. <sighs> it's devilishly hot in here, isn't it? No. Need I write a statement so you have a, a record, Detective? <sighs> uh, that won't be necessary at this time, Mr. Laurel. Now, I understand you met with Mr. Chaplin and Mr. McCluskey last night? Only for about an hour or so. It's true I was rather cross with Kenneth. He called Charles a nasty name. I shan't repeat it, of course. <laughs> Fat-headed dope. <laughs> it isn't true, Charlie. Oh, dear. That's why it's funny. Like when I call you an upside-down half-wit or a, a desiccated <laughs> cowpat. <laughs> well, I don't care for hearing my friends referred to in such a manner. Now, uh, Mr. Laurel, when did you last see Mr. McCluskey? Uh, when Charles and I told him goodnight. But I did hear him later on. There was an argument. What? When? This was after you went to sleep, Charlie. Oh, um, yes. In the hall at the hotel. A screaming <laughs> match, really. What about? I don't know. But it involved Mr. McCluskey? Yes, he was arguing with Obie Stratford. What? Damn it, Stanley! You, you, you're paying to have this cleaned. You simpering little clod. I'm afraid I won't be attending the vaudeville tonight. No? Why is that? Something came up. Margaret was quite looking forward to it. So was I. Having you with us, I mean. Maybe another time. No. My apologies. I noticed a curious... 
Uh, something the matter? No. You can confide in me. I was out with my daughter when I saw a fellow inspector. She knew that I was avoiding him because... Oh, it's happened before. Strange, isn't it? Things we've been told to pretend don't exist. I find it hard lying and hiding things. How do you do it, Watts? Oh, same as you. I feel bloody awful. Precisely. Mr. Stratford, a witness overheard you arguing with the deceased last night at the hotel. And yet you told me that you had never met him. I never said that. I said I didn't know him. Meeting someone in passing is not the same as knowing them. You argued. What about? He greased someone's palm and ended up with my room. Your hotel room? I'm the host. I'm the biggest name in Vaud. I arrive and they've given my suite to some kid from Detroit. So the argument became heated? And so what of it? Manager knew who I was, he handled things. Yes, well, Mr. McCluskey ended up dead. Maybe he killed himself because he didn't like his hotel room. He did not defenestrate himself, Mr. Stratford. He was murdered. Well, I got what I wanted. Why would I kill him? Perhaps he insulted you. You became angry. I don't get angry. I, I was standing right here when the man nearly fell on my head. How in God's name am I meant to have killed him? Rather choleric, chap. It does make a good point, though, sir. I don't see how it could have been him. Perhaps he had help. Oi! You there, stop! What is it, Josh? Sir, I was sure I saw somebody back here with a knife. With a knife? Yes, uh, I'm not sure what he was doing with me. Look, George, this rope. He was trying to cut it, but why? It's tied off here to these counterweights and connected to that large beam. Sir, if he'd made it through the rope, it would have fallen directly onto Mr. Chaplin. Dear God, has someone just tried to kill me? This is mad. Why would anybody want to kill me? I don't know. But this must connect back to Mr. McCluskey in some way. Mr. Chaplin, what room are you staying in in the hotel? 416. Why? I think I know what happened. Come with me. 416. But this isn't my room. No. But it was Mr. McCluskey's room. Room 419. The killer mistook it for 416. Indeed. And the killer, thinking he was in Mr. Chaplin's room, stalked toward the tub, again, expecting to find Mr. Chaplin inside. He throws the lamp into the bath, electrocutes the chap, and only afterwards realizes he's got the wrong man. I don't mean to dwell on the issue, but are you saying someone tried to kill me twice? <laughs> Let's assume that the killer was indeed trying to kill Mr. Chaplin in both instances. George. I apologize, sir. I'm preoccupied with how poorly I took Higgins news. Ah, yes. I, too, have had unwanted feelings from time to time about this very issue. Children? Well, yes, George. Seeing how happy Henry is, it's only natural that one would feel disappointed that you don't have that yourself. But there are other joys in life, some of which one may not be able to truly appreciate if he were to be carrying the responsibilities of parenting. Yes, I suppose that makes sense, sir. I still feel what's missing from time to time. But when I look at it in the bigger picture of my life, I can't help but feel grateful and satisfied that things are the way they are. And if that doesn't work, you can always try keeping your mind occupied. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, right, you know, I was thinking, after our last run-in with these vaudeville types, it seems to me jealousy and resentment run rampant among them. Professional jealousy could be a motive. Uh, yes, but furthermore, sir, Mr. Chaplin is a young man. So too is our victim. Perhaps the old guard are feeling threatened. 
Who among the old guard would be willing to kill to protect his position? You think I'm killing young performers? For what, to save my job? It's madness. I've been trying to retire for years. I can't. Sure, Ed Ward could take over the show. What would people be watching? Just a prop comic and who, Charlie Chaplin? Who's going to want to watch that? Well, is it possible, Mr. Stratford, that some of the less successful performers felt they were being supplanted by these younger acts? Could someone have a professional grudge against Charlie Chaplin? Who would bother? Look, I don't know if I could be any clearer about this. These kids, they're not funny. Uh, Detective, there's a man who says he witnessed someone holding a knife near the stage. Oh, very good. Ross, what are you doing to him? Mm, perhaps I should look into that. I'll go with him. Thank you. <laughs> Julia? Mr. Ward? Oh, William, watch him. He's hilarious. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Ward, I understand you are an eyewitness. Yes, I saw someone with a knife skulking around backstage earlier. Who was it? Well, I couldn't see the man's face, only his silhouette. But his hat was rather distinctive. How so? Hold on, I have one just like it. <laughs> it's here somewhere. <laughs> Mr. Ward. <laughs> oh, here. This is it. A derby, just like this. Except uh, the brim was bent, like so. May I see that? Sure thing. I think I have another one in here anyway. <laughs> Julia, really? He's funny. Please, even I'm funnier than that. <laughs> Break it up, break it up. All right, sir, you're coming with us. Take him away, McNabb. You dang melon heads. What do you think you're doing? We're stopping your father from beating the tar out of you. He's not beating me. It's a show, you morons. I'm fine. Look. Oh. Oh. Huh. That's incredible. It is all part of an act. Sure, we're a family act. That was my pa, Joe Keaton. And I'm Buster. Most impressive. Uh, Constable, bring him back. Don't worry, son. We'll let your father go. Just a moment. George, who is this young man? Uh, Buster Keaton, sir. No, oh, Master Keaton. Um, is that your hat? Sure. Well, only since lunchtime. Oh, give it to me, please. Finders keepers. That's the law, ain't it? Mm, not really, no. Ah. Monogram. Pie is Fred's gag, Stanley. We need something new. I had an idea about bread rolls and dinner forks, but... Ah, detective. Gentlemen. Do either of you recognize this hat? Like, could be anyone's. Why? This hat matches exactly the description of the one worn by the saboteur. This hat? Yes, and it has a monogram inside, the initials S.L. Now, hold on. Stanley, this is your hat. You tried to kill me. No. No! Mr. Laurel, you are coming with me. It is my hat, Detective. But I swear to you, I would never hurt Charlie. The attempted murderer was seen wearing this hat. You see, I was rather frantic. 
I found someone who recommended the cleaners to get that blasted ink out of Charlie's shirt. And I wrote the directions on a piece of paper and put the paper inside my hat. But on my way, I got rather turned around and retrieved the paper from my hat. And somewhere in the process, managed to lose it. My hat, I mean. You put down your hat, retrieved your piece of paper, and in so doing, somehow lost your hat. Oh, I am forever losing things, Detective. I swear to you, it's true. Why would I want to hurt Charlie? Professional rivalry. You are, after all, Mr. Chaplin's understudy. It is an honor and a privilege to learn from someone so talented. Charlie Chaplin is my best friend. Sir, we've spoken with the other members of the troop, and it appears Mr. Chaplin is not a considerate colleague. The others didn't like him. There is animosity. Yeah, no, that's it. Mr. Laurel worships the ground on which Charlie Chaplin walks. Maybe one of the others did it. Well, Mr. Chaplin and Mr. Laurel arrived ahead of the others. The rest only arrived this afternoon. So what do you think? Did this Laurel chap do it or not? He doesn't seem capable, sir. He's entirely deferential and, and clumsy and clueless. Well, that's what he wants us to believe, George. He is a performer, after all. But all we have for evidence is a hat, which he says he lost. It's true. Our only evidence is circumstantial at best. The vaudeville show is tonight. If he didn't do it, it would be a shame to keep him away. The question is, is he funny? Julia seems to think so. Release him. Me and the missus want to see a good show. Good evening, gentlemen. All right, George. Perhaps you and Watts should go to the vaudeville tonight. Oh, yes, sir. But don't be distracted by the show. You must keep your eyes on Mr. Laurel at all times. Right. No, mate, I know why you're upset. It was obvious why I avoided the inspector. You have to understand that men like him wouldn't accept the idea of you being my daughter. You mean he wouldn't accept you if he knew I was your daughter? <laughs> That's right. I know. I'm not angry. Well, then come to the vaudeville tonight. And what would happen if the same situation were to arise? You can't say you wouldn't do the same thing again. No. Or perhaps this time he'll approach you expecting an introduction. What then? I don't know. Thank you. I don't think I'll be attending the vaudeville tonight. No, May. You have to understand. I do. You made a difficult choice. And I'm not saying what you did was wrong. It's the world we live in. Yes. And it made clear what we both know to be true. That we can't be family in public. And if we were to try, it would only be painful for both of us. Excuse me, Father. Higgins! Hold up a moment, Henry. What is it, George? Look, I wasn't feeling myself when you gave us your big news, and I just want you to know that I truly am delighted for you. I mean, it may be the greatest thing that could happen in a man's life, and, well, you deserve it. Cigars are appropriate every step of the way. Well, thank you, George. I knew you'd be excited for me. That's why I wanted you to be Hieronymus' godfather. Really? Well, wanted, you know. Ruthie vetoed it. Veto? Miss Hart, isn't it? Would you care for some company? Why would I want that? You seem to be alone. I'm going to watch the vaudeville tonight. Company would only hinder my enjoyment. Well, that depends on the company. Maybe it would be better than the show. That would have to be some awfully impressive company. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Very nice to see you indeed. This is Obi Stratford. I'll only be a moment, gents. I need to find my things. Wherever have they got to? What exactly are you looking for, Mr. My Laurel? case. Everything's moved round. Your suitcase? Yes, brown. Uh, yay big. All right, we'll help you look. Uh... Your nose is a deeper maroon than my hat. Slow down on the drinking, sir. Drive your horse into a bale of hay. Of course, I kid, sir, I kid. My father once told me, he said, uh, son, you should always know when to stop if you're going to drink. And I said, I do know when to stop at the next place I come to. <laughs> That's right. That should suggest to you how much I like. Ooh. 
Mm, this is heavy. What kind of act uses iron gates? Oh, look. It's all in place right beneath the trap door. Look at this. It's barely held in by a single nail. I would like to bring him out right now. His name is Charles Chaplin. Please welcome Charlie Chaplin. Come on out here, Charlie. Why is Obi Stratford sharing the stage? He's a monologist. I don't know, but if Chaplin steps on this, he'll fall way through. And on to these gates. Thank you, ladies and gents. Uh, wait, wait! What? What's happening down there? Stop! Somebody's trying to kill you! What? I said! Somebody's trying to kill you. Constable George Crabtree, everyone. <laughs> we had barely begun. Did you really have to call off my entire show? This trap door was deliberately sabotaged so that the moment someone stepped on it, they would have fallen through onto dangerous iron gates. Mr. Chaplin could have been killed. That had nothing to do with me. Why did you invite Mr. Chaplin onto the stage? I felt like giving the kid a break. It wasn't planned. No one, even Mr. Chaplin, it seems, knew that it was going to happen. Meaning, you are the only person who could have lured Mr. Chaplin to his death. I like the kid. He's at least a little bit funnier than the others. Which could be precisely why you are trying to kill him. This again? How could it be me who cut one of the ropes when I was with you the whole time? You could have had an accomplice. Just as you had someone make a show of nearly crushing you with Mr. McCluskey's body right here on the stage. Ridiculous. Unless you have proof of any of this, I'm leaving. Look, I'm a young man. I know I'm not known to every household in America, but I'll tell you this. Every town I arrive in, I'm more famous when I leave. And I leave many pleased in my wake. <laughs> Women love a man with a sense of humor, so long as he is also terribly handsome. Look at this. Tonight, I performed for barely 30 seconds before the show came to a halt. A young lady still left me a note hoping for a romantic rendezvous. That is quite something. May I see that? How do you know it's from a young lady? Could be from an old lady, or a young man. Oh, jealous detective? Mr. Chaplin, I, I believe this could be a ruse. Whatever do you mean? Someone is trying to kill you, and immediately following their latest failed attempt, you receive an invitation to meet someone alone in a secluded place. Oh my. Sir, are you suggesting this note invites Charlie Chaplin to a rendezvous with death? I wouldn't put it quite that dramatically, but yes. Well, that's settled. Rip it up. I shan't be going. Actually, Mr. Chaplin, I believe you will go. The rendezvous is set to take place at this park bench here. Now, the inspector and myself will position ourselves here with a clear vantage of anyone approaching from either direction. Constables will be positioned here and here in order to intercept any potential attacker. And what about me? What about you? I want to be there, too. I don't want anyone killing someone as funny as Charlie Chaplin. Julia. We'll position you somewhere with a pram to keep an eye out. Hmm. My question is, how can we be sure that someone won't take a shot at Chaplin from distance? Unfortunately, we can't. However, I believe Obi Stratford to be our most viable suspect. Now, what? You will be following Obi Stratford the entire time, and you will remain in constant wireless communication with me. I'm meant to wear this? Uh, but, sir, we know that Mr. Stratford couldn't have been personally responsible for each attempt on Chaplin's life. Exactly. That is why we are taking extra precautions to ensure no harm comes to Mr. Chaplin. A bulletproof vest, a metal hat to work as a protective helmet, uh, rubber-soled shoes to guard against any attempt at electrocution, and a smaller, waist-worn version of my portable communication device. Why can't I use this smaller device? I only had time to make one once. I need all this. <laughs> uh, we already know someone is trying to kill me. And you're saying you want to concoct a scenario to allow him to try and kill me again? If I may, the killer concocted the scenario. We're merely trying to use it. By using me as bait. Well, not bait. More like... Well, bait, but with protection. Thank you, George. 
No, absolutely not. The risk is too high. Not just for myself, but for the world. <laughs> I detest immodesty, as you all know. But to deprive the world of Charles Chaplin is to deprive the world of laughter. That is not a loss I can accept. Oh, no, 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 no. This is ridiculous. So I, I, I can barely move in all this. Uh, this hat is very heavy, not to mention far too small. I could barely button my jacket over the bulletproof vest, and, and your communication device means I've had to wear trousers that are far too large. So, too, are these rubber shoes so large, in fact, I had to put them on the wrong feet to keep them from flying off. <laughs> George, you're only meant to look like Mr. Chaplin at a distance. You'll be covering your face once at the park bench. Mr. Chaplin, you stay put. I can barely walk in this. I know. Oh, crap, she grabbed this. <laughs> you look like a bloody tramp. Good work, George. What do I do now? Uh, just stay put. We'll alert you if anyone approaches. Watts, where are you? Uh, at the Midway, Inspector. Uh, I can see Stratford. He's uh, at the top of a ladder, taking down a banner. Good. Tell us if he moves. Mm. Sir, do you think that's a killer? It's not Stratford. Sir, it's not Mr. Stratford, but it could be someone working with him. So is that him? It's not Stratford. No, but is it the killer? We don't know, George. Should we stop him? Wait. Oh, it's just a passerby. George, George, can you hear that? Hear what? It, it sounds like it. A... a ticking. Did you say a ticking sound? Yeah, yes, sir. The trash can beside me, it's ticking. Sir. Do you remember when I showed you the replica of the alarm clock wired to a bundle of TNT? Someone set a bloody bomb. A bomb? Uh, uh, George, don't move. Don't move. It could be rigged to the bench. Oh, good Lord. Julia. Get away from the trash can. Right now. I'm terribly sorry, George. <laughs> Don't mention it. This is how Stratford's trying to kill Chaplin without being here in person. So what do we do, Murdoch? I'll have to try to defuse it. And what if it goes off before you can? Then George won't die alone. George? wires are crossed. It's harmless. So it isn't going to go off? Not unless someone were to rewire it. The explosive isn't even attached to the alarm clock. So the killer has botched another attempt on Chaplin's life, but in clever enough a way that we couldn't catch him. Unless it was never meant to go off in the first place. It's my flatulence sack. Ed Ward. He's used his flatulence sacks to hold this bomb together. Why was Ed Ward trying to kill Charlie Chaplin? He wasn't. Ward didn't get the room number wrong, but he thought someone else was going to be in that room. Until he demanded a suite that was Obie Stratford's room. <laughs> After killing McCloskey, he saw another chance.
When he sliced that rope, he wasn't trying to hit Charlie Chaplin, but the man standing beside him. What sort of the stage trap door that was sabotaged to harm Chaplin? George, Charlie Chaplin was never supposed to be on stage. Obi Stratford isn't the killer. Obi Stratford has been the intended target all along. Sir! Sir! The Midway! What? We have to get to the Midway! Stay out the way. The Midway! George! George! <sighs> the Midway, Julia! What? What? Obi Stratford is in danger. I need you to detain Ed Ward. Who? Ed Ward. Edward? Yes. E Edward who? This isn't a joke, Watts. What's funny about Edward? Nothing, nothing. The prop man. I need you to arrest him, but don't let him know that you're onto him. Otherwise, he's likely to pull that ladder right out from under Stratford. I'm supposed to arrest him without him knowing he's being arrested? Exactly. And what's his surname? No! Oh. Wait, I'm coming! I was trying to kill Obi Stratford all along. Of course I was. You wanted his job. I deserved it. You purchased your entire act. So? He promised it to me. Kept saying he was going to retire. The show would be mine. You killed a man and nearly killed several others just to advance your career. My career? <laughs> it wasn't just for my career. It was for the people. He's not even funny. Pressing upon you that my company is worth keeping. And you're doing that by showing off your wealth. Well, you already know how attractive I am. You've never had to work for a thing in your life, have you? No. Does it matter? 
No. Constable, that costume you were wearing, is there any chance I could purchase it from you? Mr. Chaplin, those items were designed to be used in the solving of a murder. I don't see what other applications they could have. Yeah, and they were very uncomfortable. I felt like a, a, a penguin trying to balance an anvil on my head. Well, I'll have to make my own, then. Charlie! Charlie, I have it! I have it. Oh, what is it? A film. I sent Stan to see those film men that were set up on the midway. They captured the whole arrest. What on earth would you want that for? Oh, I planned to study it. George's costume was marvelous, but... This man, at the center of everything, stoic in the face of chaos. <laughs> He's the funniest man in the world. Him? Oh, yes. Oh, this, this is going to be big. <laughs> oh. Well, well, well. William Murdoch, the funniest man in the world. How about that? <laughs>
but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the West. That's not actually true. Witches are not real, not in this world, despite what your Uncle George Crabtree might think. Mm -hmm. William, no need to stifle her imagination. Oh, I thought you'd be pleased I'm no longer reading to her from the periodic table of the elements. You coming to bed? Um, not quite yet. It seems my current investigation has me tied to Mrs. Hart. Speaking of witches... <laughs> Julia. There we are. Good night, Susanna. <laughs> night. Do you want to know about Morris Mages? If you're truthful. I've drunk enough to be truthful. For starters, I did not kill him. In fact, he might not even be dead. What are you talking about? That's not the point right now. An empty glass. Now, that's the point. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Majors had me bang to rights for a crime that I committed. It was years, years ago, but a crime nonetheless. <coughs> Wine. Mm. <clears throat> Back to you and Mr. Majors. Majors was a known accomplice of a man named Walter Milton. Now, he was a piece of work. I knew him to be responsible for the death of two working girls, but I couldn't prove it. And I doubt anyone cared much about their death? No, they did not. But I did. I had a friendship with them. And no, not like that. Anyway, I caught a break. An associate of Milton's was killed. I found evidence that put Milton at the scene of the murder. So I brought him in and charged him. And how did this become a problem for Mr. Majors? Majors produced a sworn statement that said he was, he was with Milton at the time of the murder. I destroyed it. But Milton did kill his associate. No, he did not. Oh. But he did kill the two women. Majors pleaded for Milton's innocence, accused me of all manner of things. Some of them true, but no one believed him. No one would take the word of a black man over that of an honest copper. And you were the honest copper? And an Englishman to boot. Fair play and all that. I was seeking justice for the two dead women and all the others that were unfortunate enough to cross Milton's path. You broke the law, stopped a man from saving his friend's life and more than likely saved the lives of many others. It wasn't noble, but it had to be done. What, you don't believe me? I have a man in this very building afraid to go to the police because the police here don't follow the law and instead do whatever they think is right. Should we not be held to a higher standard than those honest coppers? Oh, I don't know what's. All I know is I took a murderer off the street on my word, I had nothing to do with the possible demise of Morris Majors. And you think Violet Hart is behind all this? She could be. And behind what exactly? What crime did she possibly commit? She authorized the shipment of a coffin said to contain her father's body to New York City. That coffin had no body in it. And you think he's behind these two murders at the graveyard? I don't know that, but he is a suspect. If he's still alive... And you want me to question her? No, I'd like you to be there when I question her. Oh. There's no reason to believe my father's body was not in the coffin. Except for the fact that it wasn't. Inspector Brackenreed has confirmed this himself. He's confirmed nothing. Someone could have easily tampered with the body during transport. And who would do that? I must say, I don't know. Everything appears to be in order. The fact remains that the man is not dead. I examined him. I declared a cause of death. It's all right there. Perhaps you made a mistake. It does happen. You were distraught. He was your father. Perhaps you overlooked something. I was not distraught. I didn't even care for the man. The only thing that has happened here is a dead man's body has gone missing. I don't think that that is all that has happened here. Oh, no, of course. I've pronounced my father dead and then had him buried alive. Is that the sort of thing you would think me capable of? Mrs. Hart. I don't think we have begun to explore the depths of what you are capable of. We're not accusing you of anything nefarious here. You may not be, Dr. Ogden, but your husband certainly is. 
I would like to take your report with me. Of course. My father's death is a matter of public record. You are welcome to it. Observations? She's hiding something. My thoughts exactly. Impossible to prove without a body. I believe there is a body. I believe it to be alive, and I intend to prove it. I should get back to the clinic. Hopefully my patient is still there. Ah, oh, yes. If you need any help. Of course. Although, I think you might be the one who needs it. I'd like you to stay another day. My husband needs me at home. Yes, and your body needs to rest. I simply stumbled and fell. I will be fine. Why don't you tell me the truth? It is the truth. I was a coroner for many years. I've seen my fair share of violent injuries. You didn't fall down the stairs. Someone did this to you. That is your word against mine. I also examined you closely. You were taken by force, were you not? I don't know what you're talking about. Sexually? You were physically assaulted? I'm going home. To the source of the problem? I don't know what you're talking about. You and I both know what I'm talking about. This matter is concluded. There you are. Let's have a look. Oh, it certainly looks 15 years older. Very good, Irving. Let's get this to the printer. I want it up all over the city as soon as possible. Hello, Effie. George. Is it all right that I'm here? I'm trying to figure out what your aunts are up to. You might as well be a part of it. I, uh... Jeez, Louise! Ah, the reluctant bridegroom. I'm only joking. Sit down. Why are you... What? I... I can't help but wonder what you're doing here. What do you think I'm doing here? I'm here to help. George, I must say, you come from a strangely fascinating family. Violet. That's right. Is it true? Is what true? This. Is your father alive? Of course not. Detective Murdoch has clearly lost his mind. That doesn't seem likely. It seems more likely that your father is alive. He could very well be the one who broke into our salon. That is ridiculous. Why would you say that? I found this behind the cabinet where we store the liquor. Isn't this the watch he was showing off? I was going to give that to the police. I'll do that. Good day, Miss Bright. That was my neighbor who was robbed. He gave me a name. You don't think you have more pressing matters? Like a man trying to take your friend's son away from you? I understand that, but these people are untrustworthy of the police. I'm going to give them reason to reconsider that. Thanks for your help, Inspector. Thought I'd lost you. I have. I'm better than you thought. Go home, Feldy. Burn a paycheck? I think not. Uh, I'm going to return this child to a decent home, and you're going to help me. Not a chance. You think so? I'll live there. Mm -hmm. See, this sure don't look like the policeman's ball to me, does it? It's not as it seems. I know exactly how it seems. My question is, how long do you remain on the police force if these get into the wrong hands? Have a lovely day, Inspector. I still can't believe the dog came back to the graveyard. And that she did. Figure either she run off when her owner died, or maybe the killer took her. Any luck? Still none, I'm afraid. But uh, thank you for bringing her in. Guess I'm keeping her now. 
I don't believe the zombie story, you know? Oh, good. good. Then you're a sensible man. I've seen it twice before in my life, you know? Men buried before their time. I tried to get a fellow out once, but I was too late. Maybe this one got a second chance at life. This one was even featured in the Tribune. Your Aunt Oleander predicted a mine collapse. Yes, I remember that. I was just a young lad. My aunts all raced over to the mine and demanded the workers all get out. Everybody thought they were mad, and then the mine filled in. There were accounts for over a month of rain. It was a coincidence. If she didn't see it, why would she say it? People have premonitions all the time, George. Sometimes they are right, and sometimes they are wrong. Yes, but Aunt Oleander is always right. She predicted when my Uncle Lewis died at sea. She predicted that when my Aunt Lily had a baby, he would be born with six toes. Hence, six-toed Simon. You met Simon? He was lovely. Did you know he had six toes? No. Well, my Aunt Oleander did, even before he was born. And I think this time she is wrong. So what do I do? I, I, I go ahead and marry Effie. Hardly your decision alone now, George. And say, damn the consequences? I can't do that. I, I couldn't live with myself if it turned out my aunt was right. All we're saying is that your aunts might be up to something. Yes, trying to save your life. Maybe George is right. Maybe that's all it is. We'll see. I've been in contact with a lawyer who represents George's family. He was an old professor of mine. Somewhere in his files, he may have an answer. And what will compel him to surrender those to you? I may have told him, but I am now Mrs. George Crabtree, and I am representing my husband. If there's anything pertinent, he will forward the information to me. Does George know that you're doing this? He does not, Henry. He might not like what you're doing. I don't care if he likes it or not. George Crabtree is not the only wronged party here. Henry, didn't you tell me that George recently witnessed one of Oleander's predictions that came true? That I did. Perhaps you could find out something about the circumstances surrounding that. Who brought these to you? What's the matter? You want them or not? Uh, uh, stolen from a friend of mine. Huh? Uh, I wouldn't know. If you are not forthcoming, I will be forced to go to the police. Why don't you do that, huh? It was a policeman who brought them here. And did you see Mr. Majors do this? No. I believe he broke into my establishment. Before he disappeared, he showed a keen interest in it. A keen interest. He wanted to buy it out from under me. Well, and you believe he's stealing from you now? I think he's trying to harass me, scare me. Thing is, he doesn't know me. I don't scare. Do you have any proof of this? I'm sure he was in the club. I found his pocket watch behind the cabinet when we stored the liquor. Oh. Do you have it? I gave it to Mrs. Hart. She said she would make sure it made its way to you. I suppose you're right. You don't really have a choice. You don't have a choice about what? We have to leave this city with Samuel. I can stall this private detective, buy you some time. That's the solution? We run? That's no answer. You know who ransacked Trevor's apartment? New York City police. What can we do about that? Nothing. If you run, you can start a new life. Living on the run is not a new life. It's not even a life. Can I help you? Miss Prescott, I'm Dr. Julia Ogden. I am familiar with the name. I treated your wife. I came to see how she's faring. She is faring well, thank you very much. And she thanks you for your assistance. Uh, could I see her for myself? You cannot. I'm a physician. She's under my care. And I am her husband. And she is under mine. 
If you take another step, I shall have no choice but to call the police. Uh, it is I who should be calling the police on you. Don't be preposterous. Good day. Mrs. Hart. Detective. When were you planning on giving it to me? Excuse me? Your father's watch, the one he misplaced while he was burglarizing your partner's nightclub. It is my nightclub as well. He must have lost it there back when he was still alive. I see. But Miss Bright did want you to give it to me as evidence. And I neglected to give it to you promptly. My mistake. Of course. Your report states that your father's cause of death was cerebral hemorrhaging. Yes, I'm aware of that. I wrote it. It also notes that there were significant traces of cocaine in his bloodstream. Which I speculated may have been the cause of the embolism. It's quite easy for you to obtain cocaine, is it not? Despite the law, it is easy for any number of people to get their hands on cocaine. And as I remember, my father was a very heavy user. He often said it would be the death of him. So, I guess George Crabtree's aunt isn't the only one with the ability to foretell the future. Do you need any assistance, sir? Not at this time, George. I know you don't think highly of my decision, sir, but I couldn't risk it. I couldn't risk that my aunt was right. You know my thoughts on this, George. I'm very skeptical of seers and psychics and the like. Well, what would you do? I I'm not so sure that I would be willing to risk losing the chance at being happy. Sir, if you need any help. If you truly want to help me, George, find me a dead man. Are you sure? The coach that George saw run down that man was hired by his anchor, Santham. And you're sure it's the same coach? The owner claimed to have found damages. They arranged the accident. So those two are playing a game. To what end? Those witches! What? I've just received a wire from my old professor. The lawyer. Yes, the lawyer, Henry. And now I know why George cannot marry. At least not until tomorrow. His birthday? I think those two deserve a good scare. Louise. Yes? I have a favor to ask of you. Can we come in? Yes, of course. Charming. Well, I haven't exactly been at my best recently. Well, that is about to change, George. How so? It's very simple, George. You and I are going to get married. I'm delighted, George. Well, after the week I've had, I think I deserve a birthday party. And you've both come all the way to Toronto to save my bride's life. I just did my duty. And I thank you for that. I'm sorry I had to tell you the truth. Yes, but in doing so, you saved Miss Newsom's life. I mean, it was her you saw in your vision, wasn't it? She was. So you did the right thing, didn't you? Well, I will begin arrangements. We will have a grand time, George. Please feel free to bring any of your friends. Yes, I will do. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you both at the party tomorrow. Don't look so sour, Oleander. We are not doing the right thing for him. He is a good man. He deserves to be happy. You can't go to the police about this. Some of them are breaking the law. You'll just make this worse for you and your kind. My kind? What am I, a different species? Bloody hell, Watts. Get off your high horse and listen to me for one minute. I can help you if you can help me. Is that how one finds justice? 
by making deals. Do you want the police to stop harassing your friends or not? I do. And do you want Jack to be able to keep Sam? Then let me handle the police. Right. I need you to go to an apartment, and when you see that private investigator leave... The men are still out looking, sir, but there have been no sightings or reports. Mr. Majors is likely long gone if he has any sense. Have the men return to their regular duties, but keep an eye out. I will. Uh, sir, may I have the afternoon off? I suppose so. Uh, George's aunts are throwing a party. It's his birthday. Is George up for this? Oh, I think he is. William, I think you should arrest me for assault. Oh, what have you done, Julia? Alderman Prescott has blocked my access to all of the medical supply houses in town. How can he do that? He told them that it was in their best interest to not do business with me. I can get things from Buffalo, but it will take a long time. Uh, uh, Julia, I should advise you to steer well clear of him. Oh, I will. But he will soon be made well aware of just who he has taken on. All right. See you at home. Yes. Mrs. Hart. Dr. Ogden, are you my next inquisitor? Oh, I'm not here about that. And if you made a mistake, it was an honest one. Thank you. I need your access to get these supplies. If you can have them delivered to the morgue, I can get them to the clinic. Why can't you get those? Someone in high places is trying to punish me, and in doing so is punishing women throughout the city. Perhaps I could kill him. Uh, A joke, Dr. Ogden. Who is this someone? Uh, an Alderman Prescott. Adrian Prescott? Yes. One moment. I have something. Uh -huh. It's a ledger from a night spot that I'm part owner of. Oh, yes, the Starbright Club. I'm surprised I haven't seen you there. Well, I have had my hands full a little lately. Of course. My partner has been making payments to Mr. Prescott to ensure the place stays open. Uh, he's been taking bribes. He has indeed. And I can give you more information if you need. <gasps> well, thank you, Mrs. Hart. <laughs> thank you very much. Always a pleasure to welcome a neighbor from the north. How can I help you? It's not a pleasant visit, I'm afraid. It's been brought to my attention that some of the men from your precinct have been indulging in thievery. I've received no such reports. They've been too scared to come forward. Those fears are unfounded. I run an honest precinct. I don't think you do. Who were these victims? Residents of flats in Greenwich Village. Oh, the lavender lollies have their knickers in a twist. They don't deserve to be preyed upon by the New York Police Department. And I don't need some Canuck telling me how to run my precinct. I may reside and work in the frozen north, but I'm an Englishman 100%, Paddy. Now, would you rather Theodore Roosevelt told you? What are you talking about? The former president and one-time commissioner of this very force. Well, I know who he is. Well, he's a good friend of mine, and he owes me a favor. Some of my men, Canucks, saved his life. Now, he worked very hard to combat corruption on this force. I don't think you'd be pleased with your stewardship. In fact, I would guess you'd be in for a rough ride. So what do you want? I want any goods stolen from the residents of Greenwich Village returned to their rightful owners. And any of your men patrolling down there to act like policemen and not criminals. And Mr. Roosevelt? If you do what I ask, you'll be none the wiser. Then you have it. Good. Oh, and uh, one more thing. What is the meaning of this? Huh? I've done nothing, nothing wrong. You are conducting an unauthorized investigation in my precinct. I want you out of here. Do you know what this man is? Do you know what this man is protecting? Not my concern. He is allowing two known homosexuals to corrupt a child, a child to God-fearing people have a legal claim to. That is a Canadian matter. It's not my concern. Go home. Your career is over. Do your worst, Feldin. I'll be ready. We'll see. We'll see. 
Your son is yours. Thank you. And the private investigator? He's been sent back to Canada. He won't bother you again. You hear that, Samuel? Did you get them? I did. Broke into someone's home just like a regular policeman. Is this all of them? All I could find. What are those? Photographs that could ruin my career. You risked a lot for us. Thank you. It was the only way it was. Now you two can live the life you choose. I told you to leave me alone. Yes, I'm not one to listen, Mr. Prescott. This is Detective William Murdoch. I know damn well who he is. What do you want? You're under arrest, Mr. Prescott. That's ridiculous. On what charge? Accepting bribes. We have a number of witnesses who've signed affidavits to the fact. I'm sure their word means nothing. That's why we're also looking into your bank accounts. You see, money never lies. Please come with me. I will not. Then I will have no choice but to instruct my constables to take you by force. That should be quite a sight for your neighbors, I'd imagine. What are you doing? I told you I didn't... This has nothing to do with you, Mrs. Pescant. Your husband is a criminal. And if you choose, you're a free woman. I hope you have thanked Oleander for saving your life. Oh, many times over. And where is George? Well, he said he would be along shortly. Uh, he also said that he had a surprise for the two of you. Oh, well, there's no need for that. It is his birthday. Well, I think he's just glad I'm not dead. Mm. As am I, of course. Ah! Here he is! The man of the hour is here! George! Who's this? I'm Chrysanthemum, Aunt Oleander. I'd like to introduce you to my bride, Mrs. Louise Cherry. I'll be taking his name. Bride? Yes, married just this morning. George and I were an item at one time. Yeah, and I had vowed to be married by this age. And since Effie was doomed to die. Well, I jumped at the chance with Louise here. <sighs> but she's going to die. Oh, <laughs> she's not. It's Miss Newsom I saw perish. You didn't see anyone perish. <laughs> the only thing you saw perish was her inheritance. I don't know what you're talking about. I spoke to Mr. Penny. Our lawyer. Your Aunt Astrid was a very unusual woman, was she not? George was to inherit her fortune. That is, unless he remained a bachelor too long. Then he would be deemed to be useless, and her inheritance would go to you instead. I will just leave. No, you will not. I'm so sorry, George. I would have confessed to the fraudulence as soon as it were safe to do so. And as soon as she had George's money. And Chris. Aunt Leanne. George, I am in terrible trouble. I wouldn't have done this unless I had to. She's in debt to a loan shark, a very bad man. It was the only way I could help her. But now that you are wet, the money is all yours. Please just let me run. Let me run, and I will never trouble you again. And if I marry Effie, she won't die. I cannot promise that, but it is not foretold. But you were already married. We just wanted to throw you a little scare. You deserve that. <laughs> Trevor's coin collection was returned with an apology. Service with a smile. So is this what we do now? Make deals instead of follow the law? Oh, get over yourself, Watts. I've heard you say many times that the law is not justice, that the law is not always right. So you change the law. You don't break it. I saved your friend's son. You're not going to make me feel bad about that. And you should know, you're welcome back in my station house anytime. Your choice. Thank you, but I don't know if that's what I want anymore. I believe... This belongs to you. <laughs> Thank you. That would be a shame. The Force could use more good men like you. Good luck, Watts. Thank you, William. 
It was a good thing we did today. What will happen to Mrs. Prescott? I don't know. But whatever it is, it will be of her choosing. Hmm. And what of your case? It remains unsolved, I'm afraid. I suspect Mr. Majors has left Toronto. But you still think he's alive? Well, I suspect as much. Hmm? And so what now? Well, I can prove nothing. And I'm not quite sure of Mrs. Hart's involvement in all of this. But my case is at a dead end. Are you giving up? I can't just keep chasing ghosts. But sooner or later, either Mr. Majors or Mrs. Hart will reveal something. Until then, I am biding my time. Where's the nanny? Mm. So, you going to turn them both in? They're my aunt's Effie. They've had hard lives. And besides trying to fool me and nearly ruining my life, they haven't done anything wrong. No. What? You're going to give her the money, aren't you? She's in trouble. George, after all they put you through. Yes, of course. Maybe we'll keep a little something for the trip, but we don't need the money. You and I are you and Louise Cherry. <laughs> Please. Come on. What do you think? I can't promise you won't drop dead the minute you say yes. I need to go home. What? I paid a pretty penny for that dress. It's going to be used. Led that private investigator to you. But I found Samuel and I anyway. It won't stop. Misfortune follows us. You two will lead a more peaceful life without me. Yeah. Yeah. Are you leaving for good? I don't know, Jack. I'm not a happy man. I'm not happy with myself, and until I am, I shouldn't be here. Where are you going to go? That's something I don't have the answer to yet. But... My life won't stop once you leave. Nor should it. Until the next time. We need to find my father. Detective Murdoch will find out he's alive, and then he'll discover our role in all of this. And I best stay well hidden, wouldn't you say? I'd hate for something ill to fall upon my loving daughter. So, Violet, take a seat. We can have a nice family dinner and discuss our current situation. Sit. Hmm. Your husband has found excellent suppliers. The fish could be a little fresher, but uh, we do with the best we can with what we're given in this world, do we not? It's jambalaya. I learned how to make it during my time down in New Orleans. That's a place where you would prosper, Violet. A city full of fraudsters. It's made from as many ingredients as you'd like. A multitude of different tastes. Some bold, some almost imperceptible. You can't even tell what you're ingesting. Not like that speedball you gave me, Arthur. <laughs> That almost took me off this earth. Try some. I learned some things from a voodoo woman down there. She was something. She taught me how to put myself in a trance so deep. It was hard to tell if I was dead or alive. 
But you know that now, don't you, Father? You don't like it? I don't have much of an appetite. I would have thought you'd have chosen a better man. Now, see here! Don't! I'm already embarrassed for you. How about you, Violet? You always had such an appetite when you were young. I made this special for you. You think I'd do the same to you that you did to me? I'd never be so lily-livered. Mmm. Delicious. If I do say so myself. You two don't know what you're missing. important that we establish some trust while I'm here. I can give you money, any, anything you want. Just, just leave. Oh, I'm staying for a while. I'm interested in seeing how much crime a dead man can get away with. Detective Murdoch suspects you're still alive. He best not find me then, because if he does, both you and your spineless husband go down with me. Bon appetit. Get out now. I'm losing weight lately, I hear. Mm-mm-mm! Yes! Here it is, Henry. Crabtree, you're late. Your shift started two hours ago. Sorry, sir. I'll be docking your pay. Well, that sounds more than reasonable. I was attending to something very important. I couldn't wait a moment longer. Gentlemen, it's been a while coming, but I would like to introduce you to my wife. Mrs. Effie Crabtree. I'll see he makes it to work on time in the future, Inspector. <laughs> Congratulations, oh, thank George. You, thank you. Congratulations, you little bugalogs. Oh, you bugalogs. Well, that is wonderful. Oh. Wonderful. You must come for dinner. You always oh, oh, just. Oh, this must be a special occasion. If William is drinking wine, this will prove amusing later on. I would like to propose a toast to my dear friend George Crabtree and his lovely new bride, Effie. I wish you a life of good fortune and happiness. To George and Effie. Thank you, sir. Effie. Mm. Mm. Ah, look at us, George. Both happily married men now. Yes, and lucky ones at that, I should say, sir. I should give him wine more often. This is a special occasion, because I've ventured back into the kitchen. <laughs> Help yourselves. Uh, look at that. So, what are your plans? Well, oh, we plan to honeymoon once we get our affairs in order here. George has come into some money, and we plan on spending it recklessly. Oh, how marvelous. <laughs> Good man, George. I'm happy for you. Thank you, sir, as am I. Welcome to Wedded Bliss. Oh, I'll get her. So what are your plans after that? We haven't discussed that yet. Uh, at least four children, I should think. Four? Is that all? Well, yes, two boys, two girls. Or I don't know, one boy, three girls. I'm not fussy, but uh, I think a small family should satisfy me. Some more wine for you, detective? Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, why not? <laughs> it's a special 